So here we are, inside the Sphinx. Very close. Yeah, megalithic rocks all around again. Mm -hmm. We're in the temple of? That temple was designed by uh, Tutmosis IV. I see. And I believe it is earlier than Tutmosis IV. We can see some names here like Amun Hotep, and out outside we see Merin Bitah. It seems that many kings shared in building this construction. <laughs> this construction, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. Which is like the common thing we see all around is that things get reused, they get renamed. Exactly. And, yeah. Because who wouldn't uh, resist himself putting his name next to such <laughs> structure? Such structure. structure. Yes. So let's take a look I at this. I thought structure. I saw Muhammad on there. Yeah. Just if right. I have the chance, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. right have the next chance. to Ramses yeah. the second. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Put some graffiti. Uh -huh. So uh, let's go this way. Let's t go and take a look at it. So, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Let's uh, understand one of the early names of the Sphinx is Her M. Akhet. That is one of the very early of that structure. Uh -huh. Horus in the horizon. Horus in the horizon. Yes. So they wow. wanted to refer, and I think that was given to him in the dynasties to refer that this is again patriarchy world, not matriarchy. I see. Okay. Uh huh. But wow. they, they still look, they still connect between the Sphinx and the uh, the system of the sun. Yes. Okay? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Which? Because the word the Horam Akhid can mean the one that is facing the horizon. The one that's facing the horizon. Yes. yes. Her also can have the ideogram or the demonstrative sign of a face uh -huh. that is aligned. I see. Aligned with the east. I mm -hmm. see. Okay. Yes. As far um, as I can tell, the, um, amongst these guys here, I think they've solved the riddle of the Sphinx and the pyramid. <laughs> It has something to do with that symbol that's at the very top of almost everything that we've seen. Yeah, this that winged disc. That winged disc, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is in many cases mm -hmm. um, actually in three dimensions shown as a sphere, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is the power source that was given to man by the sun gods early on. And you see that in the Sumerian plates as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then you see some of the evidence of that in South America and Mexico as well. So. You know, I really believe that the wings on it were uh, expression that it had capacity to fly, it had capacity to produce gravitational effects. Um, and, you know, it as well as described, if I remember well, as the, as the ship of Horus, you know, the, the wing disc. Yes, yes exactly. Okay. It is Horus, according to the story, the two wings here are Horus, connected with the sun connected with yes. the sun. But always we will see that solar winged solar disk is connected to that title. Uh -huh. Behdet. And it refers to a very ancient important city of ancient Egypt. Mm. Okay. So we any winged uh, solar disk is supposed to be connected with that city. Related. So, to so that if city. we need, if we know what would the, the important um, importance of that city, we could figure out the meaning of the city. Yeah, maybe the maybe and the power source was in that city originally. It, it could be. And one of the interesting things that the word bah, that long thing, yeah. is the tusk of the elephant. Hmm. Oh. Okay. okay. And then the hand and the teeth. This right. may sound like a yes. wild idea, that, that because most people are told that this was just the sun going across the sky. But every temple that we've seen, every geometry, the the the, the types of stones that are used, and the resonant proportions that they have, everything reinforces that there was some sort of energy device going on resonating these chambers uh, that not only provided probably uh, power, but also resonated in a way that then would affect people's consciousness. The initiates would uh, would be pra trained by the priesthood to come up and be exposed to those uh, frequencies. Yeah, so, and then yes. not only that, we see lots of evidence of extremely large masses that were moved with apparent ease. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, that, that requires something else than chisel and vine ropes. No, wait, even uh, our technology will, like, suffer too much carrying uh, blocks here, uh, 100 tons and uh, 200 tons. 200 ton yes. blocks. Let's go and take a look at some of them. With the snakes itself is carved out of the bedrock. Right. What we see here as uh, like bricks is nothing but an elevation. 
tradition that happened too throughout the ages. Right. So, so that's important. It's important for people to know. Let's go over there and take a look from up here, from this vantage point. Zach here, one of our great tour guides as well. Hello, nice. Zach. There. So, um, so here we're beside the Sphinx. We have the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple, which is constructed out of uh, megalithic stones. Um, if we look at this stone over here, it's a good example, the one on the bottom and the other one stack on top. You can see some more across here and some more across on the Valley Temple. There's one here. And they're about 200 ton, 150 to 200 ton, right? Around this, not most of them, of course, but uh, they are bigger than the normal uh, uh, base of limestone. Right. And number two, we don't only believe that they were cut from here, but I think also from near the second pyramid. So the same area they cut around the second pyramid. From there, they brought some blocks around the pyramid itself to uh, balance the, the ground level. And they brought some here at this temple. Right. But so in this temple, so are unfortunately, they we lost almost 90 percent of the granite casing of the of this temple from inside. Right. So so not only is the 200 ton blocks available, uh, well, place in here to make the walls, but the <laughs> the 200 ton block were cased inside and outside with massive granite blocks yeah. from Aswan, right? That comes from uh, 600 kilometers from here? 1,000 1, kilometers, 1, kilometers from here. Many, many of them all removed right now. They're more visible in the Valley Temple, uh, but the casing was on the inside and the outside of these massive blocks. These massive blocks came from the enclosure. So you can see the enclosure of the Sphinx, at least some of them came from the enclosure. So, so when the, the Sphinx is carved, right, Mohamed? Uh -huh. So it's not like they built the Sphinx. They carved it. The bedrock was high level, the same like the bed level, or even a little bit higher. The bedrock was uh, at the height of yes. the head. Mm -hmm. And so they carved down to create the enclosure. Mm -hmm. When they carved down, Foster, they then just remove, you know, manageable, you know, little stone, like ting, 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 the right. surrounding stone. stone. They yeah. use the material, and when they remove the stone, they remove 200 mm -hmm. ton blocks. Which is, can add a uh, very, uh, like, uh, extra uh, job for them. Because of course. cutting and destroying the sides maybe can be easy job because they are removing it. Material. Exactly. Yeah. But now they need to keep what they cut in a good shape. Right. Because they were going to use it again. Never mind that yeah. they were cutting 200 ton blocks, which mm -hmm. is extremely difficult to manage. Exactly. Never mind stack them, mm -hmm. you know, on top of each other, which is something with large cranes today we would mm -hmm. have an extremely hard time doing. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> This is part of the only section we can see how the granite is still attached to the original piece. Oh yeah, if you come here, mm -hmm. yeah, in that corner you can see the granite that was, in the uh, that was in the original location. There, inside. Inside. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you know, if you were commissioned today to go and carve the this, this Sphinx out of a quarry, you would not for sure, with all of the technology we have today, the last thing you would do is start removing 200 ton blocks. Of course. You would remove yes. maybe one ton mm -hmm. block. Mm -hmm. And that would be difficult already. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, you would not be removing mm -hmm. 200 ton blocks. Yeah, also, laying them on the same geological levels, we can see some of the patterns of erosion. Yeah. They are continuing in the blocks. Uh -huh. Which, like this one, the conclusion. matches that one. Yeah. Oh, that one. I see. Yeah. So, so it not means only they, from where they, they cut, they don't make the uh, stuff. Yes, they put it in the same in order. The same in the same. Level. So that the geological 
uh, mm -hmm. veins and lines are mm -hmm. all matching yeah. so mm -hmm. that there is no disparity in the density of the block. Exactly, yeah. this is their target. Yeah. Yes. We've been blessed on this tour to have one of our guides is a master stonemason. This is Yusef here. Yusef, could you talk just a moment about what it would take, even if you were trying with today's technologies, to cut and lift some of these giant blocks? Yeah, of course the challenge is to cut these from around the Sphinx itself. And then this will conflict with the official story, which says that the Sphinx was a piece of rock in the middle of the quarry, that instead of taking the hard time getting rid of it, they instead of that said, let's just sculpt it as something mm -hmm. to save the work of removing the piece. This is what's said in the official I can books. tell you a story. I so, visited him one yeah. day and I found a block of limestone next to him. So I yeah. asked Yusuf what it is. He said, I'm going to make a statue from that block. Yeah. And then after like two weeks, he, I visited him again and he was starting like shaping the sides. And after two weeks again or three weeks, it became like a head, clear shape of a head. And after three months, I could see some details. And then like after five months, I managed to see the, the like good shape of a statue. Of a statue. From limestone, that yes, size. That size. Yeah, yes, Nothing. like 80 centimeters maximum. Right, right, right. So apparently right. the because makers I, of this had some kind of tools we don't have. Exactly. <laughs> ah, that's, yeah, the trick. Yeah. that's what I was missing. You needed more so, copper chisel. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So the, the challenge here we are talking about is if you have the capability to remove these blocks from around the Sphinx and put it in the same geological order, like we see the, the, the erosion levels are continuing. It's the same. Like that. Mm. So I wouldn't think then removing that piece of stone can be challenging a, a for big those. Problem. Exactly. Yes. Of course, so, you, you left it there on the purpose. Yes, it has a significance. <laughs> right. It has because a significance. I remember when I was young, some hard work in my town. Mm -hmm. When people, they carry those kind of big bags, 100 kilograms, mm -hmm. they carry the bag and then they like push it away and then they go bring on so they don't care about how they replace them right but in this case no every stone comes out from here right comes out with a certain number yeah and location and, and height yeah okay which is again extra job for the original job for sure yeah. uh, so you know of course again like it would be much easier to just chip the stone mm -hmm. uh, enclosure and remove the material in manageable stone uh, manageable size yeah unless you've got something extraordinary unless you have extraordinary technology and for you to be removing 200 ton block is not a problem right and some of the blocks are not even straight like this blocks a corner blocks isn't it yes yeah so some of the blocks are actually corner block and l shape, l -shape. the same reflection on the other side uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On the other side, yeah. you can see an L-shaped block again that's making the corners. So, like, mm -hmm. that means that you're actually removing a large portion of the material to make the L. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. uh, so, so what's the principle there? Why, why do that? Well, most likely, you don't want seams at the corners. So, that means you don't want the walls to be in individual self-standing <laughs> walls mm -hmm. you want the whole structure to work together mm -hmm. and uh, so for resonance for um, for earthquake protection mm -hmm. all this that would be important yeah. right yeah. and that is why we can think about something very important yeah we saw the obelisk we saw the 1000 statue 1000 tons of statue so they can easily throw a big stone and they can do the stinks. Right. Why they had to hack all the, st the stones around and they fill this, unless this was the design. That was that, the design. That was, that stone is the, the stone they, the design required and the function won't be. Okay, well, there's the other thing is that the dating of the Sphinx, mm -hmm. right? There's the problem yes. of the dating of the Sphinx. So, according to, um, I will not say very good evidences, but some evidences, maybe weak, yeah. that the Sphinx is related to Kipfrin. Yeah. And also according to similar uh, evidences that Kipfrin who built the second pyramid. Right. So, we are talking about the fourth dynasty, the fourth dynasty. around 2600 BC. 2600 BC, but all yes. that evidence is supported mainly because of the seller, right? No, actually the seller is talking about different king, 
Okay. And it didn't mention uh, at least what we can read because there is the lower part is broken. That's right. So it didn't mention who built the things or. Right. Why don't we go in here close yeah. to that? There is a broken uh, cartouche, but we cannot see much details of it. And Let's they claim not go too far in because I'd like to look at the erosion on the. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the so the evidence that it, that the sphinx was carved by Capru is mm -hmm. um, is is what? Ah, according to the beard. We saw a design, uh, a carving for uh, some symbols on the beard, and that beard, most of it in the Egyptian museum. Right. The same type of carving was done by Kofu in one of the northeastern... Uh, by Kofu. Uh, yeah, by Kofu in yeah. Sinai. In Sinai. So some people say, okay, if we see the two carvings similar, mm -hmm. so the same hand did it, so it will be Kofu. I see. Okay. But, uh, but then there's the issue that mm -hmm. kings used to go to all kinds of statues and put right. their name on it. Exactly. So how do you and know there is it's no Kofu? name even. It is as a design which can repeat it can be repeated by any person. By yeah. Any carver. Yeah, and the, and it was common to see in Egypt everywhere mm -hmm. the same design being repeated right. many places right. yeah. with different king's name on mm -hmm. it. Right. Exactly. The beard was not part of the bedrock. Right. So it could have been added at any time. I see. And that's yeah. why the beard is fallen. Uh, it's fallen. Uh, and we can see the holes of the, the checks to support the pier. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, like that was strings. placed yes. underneath it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, I, th 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 that brings us to the next issue, mm -hmm. is that the head seems to be disproportionately small Smaller. Yes. compared to the body. Yes. So there's a lot of support to think that the head was actually recarved. Exactly. Not only small. But in a better condition than the body. In a better condition mm. than yes. the body. Yeah. So when what you happened? look at the erosion yes. uh -huh. on yeah. the body, and, and you look at the erosion on the head, it looks completely is, different. The head is supposed to be the most eroded part of the statue. Sure. Because it was covered by sand for centuries. <laughs> and sand must protect the body. Yeah. But we see the opposite. So it means that the body, uh, the whole statue mm -hmm. was... Uh, exposed to severe erosions, right? But then, when they recarved the head, they chiseled all, all the, the erosion away. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so what you mean is that the body was in the sand for a very long time, but mm -hmm. the head was sticking out. Mm -hmm. So the head should have more erosion exactly than the body. Than the body. And, but the and it's yes. the contrary. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, so that's supporting evidence that mm -hmm. that was recarved. And we understand from the history that uh, so many names restored the Sphinx. It mm -hmm. started with Tutmosis IV. Uh -huh. He admitted in that stila that he removed mm -hmm. the sand and he uh, right. cleaned the area. Right. We have Hatshepsut, mm -hmm. we have Kha and Wasit, and we can see some of those uh, renovations and restorations from the ancient Egyptian times. Right. And then there's the other evidence, which is the erosion in the enclosure, right? Mm -hmm. So if we look at the enclosure, the, the erosion in the enclosure, and the erosion on the on the stones that makes the, the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple as well. Um, so, so this is mostly the work of uh, Robert Chop. Yeah. Robert Chop and John Anthony West. And John Anthony yes. West, which notice this kind of erosion all in the enclosure Those and these fissures. Yeah, these vertical yes. fissures. When they started to study the Egyptian weather in the last 5,000 years, mm -hmm. they didn't uh, find that our rain or the, the even with the, the worst weather in winter time, we don't have that rain can produce such, such erosion. 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 Right. So they uh, came up with the idea that this must happen in the during the cataclysm which occurred on 11,000 BC. Yeah, like the mm -hmm. meltdown of the ice age. Yes, that right. is, was the only thing can because produce again, that level of water erosion. Right, yeah. because you need a lot of water to produce to that. Okay. So that's is from this rain or that is that from flood? That's from oh, rain. Yes. From rain. From rain. From rain. The rainy era. Rain. Yes. The rainy era, according to Dr. Robert Schott, mm. that ended 9,700 BC. Mm. Okay. But non stop rain. And that's mm. by, because in, uh, if you stay the whole winter in Egypt, it, you don't feel any rain. Right. So right. it will never cause this. Yeah. Even right. after five or ten thousand years. Right. But it must be rainy season. And you get the same problem on the Valley Temple blocks, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And on the Sphinx blocks. When we look from here, if you guys want to take a look over there, 
you can see that those massive blocks on top are vastly eroded. Vastly eroded. And we know that they were covered with with um, granite. with granite. Yeah. So the granite, um, you know, so this level of erosion must have occurred after the granite was removed. Yes, for right? sure. Or, or, or fell out or, mm -hmm. or got eroded itself. Mm -hmm. So oh, now we're it. talking vast mm -hmm. amount of time for that sure. to happen. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, this could be vastly much older, oh, this yes. whole complex. There than are some opinions saying that this could be 80,000 BC. 80,000 oh, BC, yes. my God. That's <laughs> there is also another yes. conclusion that the, the stones were already eroded before they, they were constructed. And then we looked at the, uh, the indentations that they used to interlock the granite, and it has the same kind of erosion. So maybe, maybe not. We cannot be right, sure. Right, right. Because if, if the, the if surface had the erosion and they do the indentation to put the granite, then right. the erosion was going to be Yeah, erased. so if they put the casing stone granite yeah. into the block into the and they carve to put the stone in the block and there's new. yeah yes. and there's erosion in that cut we know that the erosion happened after the mm -hmm. the the granite was removed exactly. or was, fell out was yeah it was interlocked so that means the erosion happened when the building was built, was done, and was yes. done, was exactly. not the, the, the block were cut with erosion in it. No, of course, no way. you wouldn't yeah. cut blocks that are like, you know, already yeah. falling apart. You would, for sure. you know. Well, so, you have to get the solid blocks and go down anyway to get solid blocks. Right, right. So yeah. dig out, let it erode, then yeah. carve. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. We can see those That's little right. breaks from limestone. All the dark colors are ancient, especially those sections in the middle. So uh -huh. This is dynastic. So, so that's dynastic repairs, right? Yes. And okay. the newer layers of the lighter color from uh, modern times, the last renovation happened in 1999. Right. Okay. So and it's already so falling apart. Right. <laughs> and, and it's not doing so well. No. Right. You have chosen very bad type of lima stone. Uh, yeah. So, you, so that tells you how well you need to know the geology, you know, to be able to pull off these kind of temples and these kind of structures, right? You got to know what you're doing. So, uh, so this is very enigmatic. It's not, it's not obvious at all. And they, it's been sold to the public as this is obvious, this is how it was done and all this. And it's just not the case. No. It, not in any way, shape or form. When uh, uh, Dr. Salim Hassan was renovating and moving all the sand here, they found many objects. Uh, leads us to some facts. Number one, they found small uh, statues of miles. So they found some stelas, we call it the ear stela, they represent one ear, and that is what the style of uh, to go to the temple and ask for uh, a miracle or uh, for something, so they make the shape of the ear, so as if you want God to listen to your uh, need. Mm -hmm. So that is why we made a conclusion that the Sphinx was in the shape of a lion or a lioness. I see. Okay. Then another idea saying, no, it was Anubis, the uh -huh. guardian of the cemetery. So if it was but Anubis, it would have been like the head of a dog. Exactly. Or, yeah. And the tail, mm -hmm. okay. So I defend the first opinion, the first, second opinion, and I say, now, if we think the pyramids are tombs, yeah. this is will be Anubis. Right. But if we think the pyramids are something else, something else this is will be Tifnut or the lion. The lion. Faces east. Faces east. Anubis must face west. Uh -huh. mm. And that's why in the tomb of Tutankhamun, when they found the jackal, it was facing west. Yeah, Anubis. Yes. Yeah. And the Howard Carter was very accurate when he made that comment right. that he found the, the jackal <laughs> facing west. West. Because Anubis is the opener of the past in the west side. Yeah, Anubis is the opener of the past, the one that leads you to the mm. underworld, right? Exactly. And so this would be different, be, and and then as well, there's the there's the the constellation relationship mm -hmm. yes. with Leo, with Leo mm -hmm. where you know Leo rose right in front of the Sphinx yes. some eleven thousand years ago. Ten thousand five hundred. Ten thousand five hundred. Okay, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the names that the Sphinx had once was called Per Hul, mm -hmm. which means the house of the lion. The, lion. Uh, the house of the lion. The house of the lion. Okay, well, that's pretty supportive. <laughs> yeah. So that, that head must have been the head of a lion. Yes. Right. And then yeah. it would have matched the body a little bit. Remember the, uh, uh, in the museum we saw a statue of a lioness from the fourth dynasty. Mm -hmm. Okay, from right. uh, Strakota stone. Right, right, right. Some, yeah. So the idea of having that statue from the first dynasty and earlier, mm -hmm. because I believe they witnessed the statue like this. Right. Okay. So all the dynastic Egypt could have just stumbled across the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Sphinx might have been there already. Mm -hmm. It might have been a lion facing the mm -hmm. east, and. Um, they eventually dug it out, they eventually repaired it a little bit mm -hmm. and recarved the head. Yeah, and don't forget the statue of the Middle Kingdom, uh, the Sphinx, was complete lion except the face only, mm -hmm. not the whole head like here. Right. So it has the, the hair of the lion, the ears of the lion, yeah. all the details except the, the face the of face. The, the human or the, the one uh, right. from tennis. The one, yes, from tennis for being Ibn Mimkhat. And it, ha it has a relevant factor to this because that <coughs> statue Muhammad is talking about has three different names on it. I see. <laughs> and I see. the statue is related, related to an from older era one. than the three names. You can find the name of Merim Pitah, of course, and Ramses the second, second and yes. Besus. Yes. yes. So three names. But the iconography of the statue still itself related it to the Middle Kingdom era because they found statues in the same iconography with writings from the Middle Kingdom. Right. So it could have been it could have been the same that the that the it was a head of a lion and then the middle just the face got recarved. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Especially when we see the size of the head is much smaller than the body. Right, yeah. right. Maybe we cannot realize this because we are very close. Right. But especially from the other side in the higher uh, ground, we see this very clearly. Yeah, the, the head is like a circle made with. Uh, yeah, on a, on a really big body. Right. <laughs> we can look at the erosion on the Sphinx as well, not just the, the enclosure. There's quite a bit. Is there, a, I think there's more on the rump. Yes. So in the back, mm -hmm. some of the erosion is quite significant. You know, when you look at this erosion here, you need a lot of water to produce that. Mm -hmm. This is uh, pretty good quality limestone. Yes. It's, uh, that is why they used it to build the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple. You know, the other thing that strikes me is that sandstone, uh, limestone, is not necessarily easy to quarry in big blocks. Sure. Because it has a tendency to crack, it mm -hmm. has a lot of fissures mm -hmm. in it. All the layers above the bedrock have cracks, so you cannot get one piece of three meters, right. two meters. And sometimes it is too hard to find even one meter long. Yeah, so it must have been really hard for them to get those 200 ton blocks out of the enclosure. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been much easier to make, you know, I don't know, like uh, uh, even just like 20 ton blocks or... True. Or 10 ton blocks, which would have been hard enough already. Of course, especially after the granite casing, then it would be more than enough. Right, no kidding, mm -hmm. because now you got granite casing on top of, mm -hmm. of limestone. I mean, it's not like, I mean, that, that must have been completely bomb proof mm -hmm. already, sure. right? But then 200 ton blocks. Mm -hmm. Why? Are you dealing with really, really high energy? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're dealing with something so powerful. This is what I'm talking about, that they, even with the uh, super technology, this is still strange for me, that why they didn't arrange other clocks from somewhere else, mm -hmm. okay? And it will be easier for them, because okay. here they must be precise. Any stone they lose, it means that the design is, is, is lost. Right, is lost. Right, because they're trying mm -hmm. to map. You can see they're, they're As matching if they the layers. Them, yes, they cut from here and rebuilt the same shape outside. Outside. So they lose block number two or three or four, the whole design, the whole design is, 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 is done. Accurate. It's done. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. So this is very important because some people came with the idea that the ancient Egyptian actually didn't build the stone, but they molded the stone. Oh, right. Yes. But we are telling them the fact that, okay, any sample from the Valley Temple or the Sphinx Temple, with this, they will match 
One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Right. But the story of molding the stone is not is not correct. Not Never correct. mind that every stone is a different size. Different size, different height, different, different shape. Shape. Yes. So you would have to have a mold for every exactly. stone. So we must need three million <laughs> molds. Yeah, two million. Yeah. For the pyramid, uh -huh, you need yes, two million three hundred thousand molds <laughs> exactly. for every stone. That uh -huh. makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And and you can match the stone to the enclosure, so you know. Oh, of course. Yeah, it, it's not molded. Of course not. Okay. Well, you know, here you can definitely see the water erosion. It's very significant. You know, it's very deep fissures, mm -hmm. and and the erosion on top there on the Sphinx is very significant as well. Right above the repair block. This is. This is probably why even the dynastic Egypt said, oh, we got to repair this, it's falling apart, right? Yeah. There is a hole here in the back side. Oh, yeah? So actually, I'm not very sure uh, where it goes. Where it goes, and so the, this huge, there is underground tunnel, or just a tunnel limited under the tunnels. I see. Okay. I see. But I think one day we may have some good ideas and stories about it. Right. Well, it's, it, it's interesting as well that in many cases, you know, the, the Sphinx, or at least, you know, the food dogs in, in China mm -hmm. represent the, uh, the guardians of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Usually yeah. they're thought to be sitting on the mm -hmm. knowledge. So if there is under mm -hmm. not underneath chambers or tunnels mm -hmm. and something, they might have been a uh, repository under mm -hmm. there of knowledge that was important mm -hmm. that the Sphinx was guarding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how many people they say the Sphinx is guarding the whole of records. The whole of records, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, which was, I think, Edgar Cayce uh, mm -hmm. as well had mm -hmm. some readings on. Maybe I disagree about this from a certain point of view that it is not written records. Mm -hmm. But I feel it is like thing, something you feel. It comes to your mind. But I not see. necessarily something to read, like to papyrus or something. Right. More like the Akashic Records, yes. the, mm -hmm. in the field of cosmic mm -hmm. consciousness. Ah, that's, yeah. that's interesting. Because from many visits I made to many places in Egypt, I can see that the ancient Egyptian made even the design to make you understand. But the problem, we don't. Because we still think very materialistic. Uh -huh. Okay, we still think about some things in, in our modern life, modern technology, and then cut the relation with the, the natural system, system that the, ancient the, Egyptian the used natural to have. order. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh -huh, I see. Yeah, which the Egyptians were clearly adept in. Mm -hmm. When you look at the way they interacted with nature, the way mm -hmm. they talked about it, the way even like their incredible capacity to Ooh. reproduce physiognomical, uh -huh. you know, accurate depictions Let in their statues. Let me tell you this, uh, now uh, the, all the pregnant lady to know uh, they will have boy or girl, they go to the doctor with uh, ultrasonic. Ultrasonic, yeah. If we use ultrasonic too much, what will happen to the baby? Well, it won't be, be healthy. Okay, good. Yeah. The ancient Egyptian had this natural system by bringing two seeds, barley and wheat, uh, wheat. Uh -huh. Okay, and they cured the urine, urine of the pregnant lady, and within a week one will grow. Barley means boy, wheat means girl. Really? Wow. You see? Wow, this is, this is because, because of the hormones. Exists. Exactly. Ah, wow. So here is the question, how did they know that the, the hormones of the boy affecting barley and the hormones of the girl affecting uh, wheat? Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. But they would still use it because if we talk about technology, they may have other tools, right. but they didn't use any of those technologies. Right. They used natural elements. Natural elements. Mm -hmm. So they, it shows they had a really in-depth understanding of nature. Mm -hmm. They worked with nature in an amazing way. Mm -hmm. I mean, to do this, um, you know, some of the most important natural forces that we experience every day on Earth Mm -hmm. is gravity sure. and sure. it will kick your ass right mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean you don't just start picking up mm -hmm. thousand ton blocks 200 mm -hmm. ton blocks and moving mm -hmm. them with mm -hmm. ease unless you have mm -hmm. some very 
you know, mm -hmm. profound way to interact with, with gravity. Of course, because we are not talking about one clock or two or ten. We are talking about a great number, yeah. millions of stones. Right. Now, when we just think about loading them and sending them to the field, uh, to the location, that is, will take years. Mm -hmm. So what about just putting them in layers above till 139 meters? So that is, as you say, we, they must be completely capable of doing this. Right. With tools can make that job very, very easy job. Right. Because we agree that when they place a stone above the lower one, that stone must be weightless. So they can push it, they can control the sides. Mm. Right. But a piece of 100 tons Right. Just, I am very sure, even with our technology, when we put it down, we must have a mistake. At least one centimeter wrong off the center or off the edges, so yeah. we must put it back. Right. So, so how do you move it? Exactly. Right. right. Again, this, sound, this may sound crazy to people who haven't been introduced to this, but I know in the work of John Hutchison from Canada, where he's got devices where he uh, has coils and aims energy at a particular location, and then metal starts to wobble and then soften and it joins together. Uh, and the other quality that it has subjected to this field is that it tends to lift off the ground. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a miniature version, it's a baby version of what may, they may be had yeah, here, maybe, yeah. but it's an indication that that can happen. Right, right, exactly. One of the things about this um, as a lion, mm -hmm. uh, Patricia was saying earlier that the feline, uh, the representation, the fee of that is iron like FE for iron, mm -hmm. and that it was actually the connection to the ability to um, magnify and harness the magnetic, electromagnetic force field. Mm -hmm. And so, and also had a relationship with water, and that that was the significance. Yes. And lion is like alignment, mm -hmm. so the word alignment coming from that same basic understanding. So the notion of being aligned here, mm -hmm. magnifying, tapping into, and harnessing the electromagnetic energy, right? And mm. also the transmutation of gold in terms of alchemically speaking. Well, you know, it definitely was clear that the ancient people that did this, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say ancient Egyptian because it's not clear at this point that it was dynastic Egypt anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people that did this were very concerned with alignment. Mm -hmm. and True. that they actually m made great effort to align their monument very precisely mm -hmm. uh, to True North and, and, and the cardinal uh, forces on the planet, the, the, the interaction of the magnetic field with the surface and, and so on, even globally, mm -hmm. uh, the relationship of these temples with other temples around the world and so on. So, so there's... It seemed to be like a very advanced master plan that was going on For sure. very early on. And I want to confirm what Kimberly just said, because I told you that why they didn't bring any other stone from outside, because they wanted that stone mm -hmm. from this area. Number two, there is, I forgot to mention, uh, you can see the, the corner we just passed from that wall. Yeah. There is a canal cutting the whole way between here, be between this area and the first pyramid. So as if like a canal between the two pyramids. Wow. That canal used to fill all this level with water. Oh. So that's why we claim she is a Tifnut because of this. She is the lioness recumbent in her lake. I see. Okay. So water and yeah. electromagnetic energy. Energy. Yeah. I see. And, and that's why we're going to see later, look, to this tube comes out from the ground to pump out all the underground water. Huh. I see. So we are in a rocky area. Uh -huh. And are there other sites around the world that are aligned with this same alignment? Can anybody address it? Hugh, you can, you can address it. We're lying east, yeah. 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 Directly east. With yeah. The equinox. Definitely. Yeah. In South America yeah. and yeah. so on. There's a direct correlation in alignment uh, between Teotihuacan and Giza. Um, as well, you know, alignment in relationship on the Earth. Uh, between Giza, Peru, and Easter Island. I mean, it just goes on and on, and you know, in, down the rabbit hole you go, because all of a sudden you start to see correlation across the world, even construction method, mm -hmm. right? 
where these cultures shouldn't have been anywhere close to being in contact with each other. So clearly you have advanced knowledge of geodesic, you know, geomagnetic, geo uh, structures around the world, uh, and advanced knowledge in, in, uh, in the stone quality and everything you need to know to do this stuff. Uh, advanced astro, uh, astronomy uh, exactly. knowledge, astronomical knowledge, astrom and, 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 and you have this like great mystery that unfolds um, all around the world, you know, construction methods that are very unclear. So, you know, a bunch of people pulling in vine ropes, kind of doing things like in kind of like archaic way, mm -hmm. just doesn't add up to this result. We've also got in common in those places the stories of, about sun gods coming in their ships and chariots and, yeah. of fire and so forth. Right. So what were they talking about with that? Right, exactly. Mm. That's the Maybe other thing. the opposite here in Egypt, that as you said, in Mexico, in Peru, they talk about the sun god comes to the world. In the Egyptian mythology, actually, it leaves. Really? Yes. Say more. Okay, so we have uh, the pictures of the, the ships of the sun god Ra and the other letters. <laughs> They are sailing in the second life. Okay. And uh, often life. shown with the sphere in the middle, mm -hmm. right, of the ship, um, mm -hmm. and, and with the sun gods leaving, right? So, mm -hmm. maybe, so maybe this is that... Not exactly leaving, but like it's not in this life. It's, it's in the afterlife of mm -hmm. the ancient Egyptians. Right, right. Sailing daily. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so definitely... But that's interesting as well. Maybe... You know, an earlier civilization that was very advanced was present before cataclysm, mm -hmm. and after cataclysm, they left some evidence of their presence and then moved on mm -hmm. to, to other places. Could be. Could be. Yeah. And that could be the discussion about the underworld and the afterlife that's mm -hmm. found. It might not actually relate directly to death. I know. The ancient yeah. Egyptians were against that word completely. Uh -huh. That is also, they didn't say the word this as we say it nowadays. Right. This for them is, um, they have the word mut or mat, right. mean that the death of the physical body, right. which they tried also to keep in a good condition by mummification. Right. But they were very sure that that moment of the, we lose the physical body, the spirit will start its journey to the second life. Right. And not that kind of spirit also, the ba will continue and then will move to the third level to become the Ah, the lightened uh, body. The so light the, body. Light body. Uh -huh. okay. wow. So yeah. from the body, which red, to the Ba, the spirit, mm -hmm. to a, a certain level of the sky, mm -hmm. and then outer sky, it will be the Ah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, and that's represented in some cases with the... Mm -hmm with the, the stargate, the gate at the mm -hmm. Holy of Holy where, where the mm -hmm. departure is mm -hmm. into the astronomical world, mm -hmm. which is depicted very, very We saw at Dandara, precisely. who got the picture of the stargate Dandara, yes. Yeah, in Dandara, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's very, you know, I, it's a whole new story emerged. Mm -hmm. uh, a story that hasn't been told because, you know, the archaeologists that came here came here in the 1800s, right? Uh, yes, they started from the Greek-Roman, actually. Yeah, the Greek-Roman. But Roman. let's say they, they started to build their opinions from the 17th, 18th century. Right. And the technology were limited. Right. So they couldn't so come, up with, uh, come up with anything else. Exactly. The technology that was here, mm -hmm. the astronomical relationship that were here, and mm -hmm. all this, were more advanced than mm -hmm. what they could they had in their own uh, civilization. So like they I, I imagine if one of those uh, archaeologists in the 17th century went to City First Tomb yeah. and he looked to the maps of the star, he will not understand anything. For him, just a regular star, Stars. decoration, and that's it. Right. But now we understand because we know this because of our technology and knowledge. Now exactly. And when we were in a tunnel in the Osirian the other day, they were depicting what looks like moving into higher realms, mm -hmm. de the death of the body, but moving on. And they, they actually had a, a reclining body, like a, like a corpse, 
and then reflected above it, divided by a line, was the same body looking back down. It was almost like an astral body it lifted out, and there were the ships talking about them moving on, and of course the same orb once again. Right, the same orb. It's amazing the way these stories start to tie together.